Hey guys, sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm having a hard time connecting to the internet in my hotel room. It's 1 a.m., 1 10 a.m. here in Istanbul. But in any case, I'll pick up from where I left off. The last thing I was telling you is a regular practice of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in which ida awa ida farashihi farashihi kulla laylatin jamaaka fihi when. Every time he would lie down in his bed, he would hold his hands together. ثُمَّ نَفَثَ فِيهِمَا فَقَرَأَ فِيهِمَا قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ وَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ وَقُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ He would recite the last three surahs into his palms, and then he would, you know, he would blow into them, and then he would ثُمَّ يَمْسَحُ بِهَا مَا اسْتَطَاعَ مِنْ جَسَدِهِ Then he would wipe over as much as he could of his body. وَأَقْبَلَ مِنْ جَسَدِهِ يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ ثَلَاثَ مَرَاتِ He used to do this three times over. So this is the practice of the Prophet ﷺ to protect himself in the night. Now, the reason I wanted to recite all of these or, or share all of these narrations, just a couple more that I think are so beautiful. One time the Prophet ﷺ was passing by, سَمِعَ رَجُلًا يَقْرَأُ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ He was just, he passed by and he heard a man reciting, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ And the Prophet ﷺ started saying, وَجَبَتْ وَجَبَتْ It's become mandatory. It's become mandatory. And they said, مَا وَجَبَتْ The companion said, what's become mandatory? And he said, وَجَبَتْ لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ Heaven has become mandatory as a gift to be granted to that person who was reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas. So it's a really beautiful benefit and uh, a, a powerful reminder that we shouldn't be lazy in reciting Qul Hu Allahu Ahad. And it's the beauty of Qur'an. Many of you don't know a lot of Qur'an. You only know like the short surahs and this is one of those short surahs that you know. Recite it with the heart that Allah rewards it a great deal. And of course, I'm, I'm a person that believes that the recitation of the Qur'an, if it's done without contemplation, without trying to internalize the meanings of what's being recited, then you're missing the point. Like, meaning these benefits or the heaven that's being granted or the protection that's being given. None of that actually has any meaning if you're not engrossed in the actual meaning of the message. The Qur'an is not words to be uttered first and foremost. It is a message to be internalized. So that's, my hope is these few moments that we have together, I share something with you about that. Those of you that just joined once again and don't know who I am, I am this weird guy, his name is Norman Ali Khan. I talk a lot. Uh, and here I am talking again, and this time I'm talking about Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Falaq, and Surah Al-Nas. So just a couple of quick things. Now, the one thing that I wanted to highlight about Surah Al-Ikhlas, before I talk really about the, the next two surahs briefly with you guys, is a word used to describe Allah in this surah that He does not use anywhere else in the Qur'an to describe Himself. And that's the word as It's a unique word to the surah. There's, it's never used anywhere else in the Qur'an. And so Allah says, Allah is Allah is... You know, it's translated sometimes Allah is the Allah the Absolute, or Allah the fulfillment of all needs. That's one way of looking at the word summit, the fulfillment of all needs. So I'm going to read some things to you in Arabic and translate them, of what is hopefully giving us some insight as to what a summit means. Samada as a verb or samadan, qasadahu to intend for something, the final goal of something. Meaning our goal is to reach Allah Azza wa Our goal, our intent in life is Allah's pleasure itself. Allah is the only worthy goal there possibly can be. He's the ultimate qasd. And that's one of the meanings of the word as samad. It also means whatever goal you have in life, whatever thing you're trying to attain, whether it's relief, whether it's some kind of success, you're trying to graduate from school, you're trying to get a job, you're trying to get married, you're trying to get away from this trouble situation, whatever your crisis may be that you're trying to get towards, or what are you trying to get away from, then the goal, that goal cannot be attained unless you go to the one who can fulfill that goal for you and that would be a summit. I'm really glad you guys are jumping in once again. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> and sorry about the technical difficulties in the middle. Once again, I would love to hear from you as, as I finish this up. I'd love to get your questions also. So in later live posts, I can actually address some of your questions inshallah ta'ala. That would be something I learned from is the kinds of questions that you have. Anyhow, so Ibn Abbas was asked, what do you think Samad means? And he says, huwa sayyid alladhi yusmadu ilayhi fil hawa'ij. He is the leader, he is the, the, the chief, meaning the, the authority that you go to in times of need. And this is an important concept. Let's put Allah aside for a second and think about the word just in a language sense, or in a social sense really. When you have a problem, you go to someone who can solve that problem, right? You have a... You have a problem with your home or your property, you go to someone who can help solve that problem. You have a criminal problem, you go to the police, you go to the judge or whoever else. If they're not able to solve your problem, you go to the one above them. And then if, you can, if they can't solve it, you go to the one above them. In other words, you keep going up the hierarchy chain of command until you get to someone who can, who has the power or the authority to solve your problem. Just think of a small example, like you go to the store and 
you know, you have a problem with, with what you bought and the, the cashier is not helping you. You say, can I talk to the manager? And if the manager doesn't help you, I want to talk to the owner. You keep going up the ladder to address your problem. A samad means there's no one higher than him to go to. All needs in the end go back to him. And we don't have to go through someone to take one step and then another step and another step. Actually, we go to him as the ultimate fulfillment of all of our needs. That's the beauty of our connection with Allah. Which is why the word as samad in a language sense also means ar-rafi'u min kulli shay, the highest of all things. There is no higher authority you can connect to. There's no better connection you can have than Allah himself. As samad huwa al-alimu bi jami' al-ma'lumat. Samad means the one who knows all the things that need to be known. Meaning when you come to him with your circumstance and you make your case to him, he knows what you said about your situation. He also knows the things you didn't say. He knows the full situation before you even said it. And who can best give you what you need than someone who knows your circumstances better than even you yourself. As samad huwa al-halim. This is really important. Just because somebody can fulfill your needs, somebody has the authority, the ability, the power, the capability, to give you what you need, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to do it, right? You can go to the judge and say, judge, I need this, 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 and this. And the judge says, I don't care, that's your problem. I can do it, but I'm not in the mood. That happens all the time. There are people in position of power, but they're not sympathetic to you, right? And so, a samad is someone, al harim he's actually someone who's forbearing, caring, considerate, and he takes into consideration your needs. Once again, by the way, those of you that just joined and, or accidentally stumbled upon this because your cousin who hates you sent you this link. My name is Numan Ali Khan, and I like talking about the Quran a lot, and here I am talking about it again. Okay? Anyway, so, ذَلِكَ كَوْنُهُ سَيِّدًا يُخْدَى The other meaning of it is, a samad هُوَ سَيِّدْ الَّذِي قَدْ إِنْتَهَا سُؤْدَدُهُ like there's no higher authority than him that you can go to. I mentioned that to you before. The one who made everything, al-khaliqu lil ashiyah, has been mentioned as the meaning of the word samad. Meaning, how can you go to someone to fulfill your needs? Then, who, who would better be qualified to take care of your needs than the one who created you and the things you're in need of? He's the master, the owner of all of them. Okay. Of course, it also means the one who decides, يَحْكُمُ مَا يُرِيدُ He does what he wants, and nobody can follow up and question him on his decision. In other words, you're going to someone, once he passes a verdict, nobody can come and undo that verdict. Also, finally, لَا يَقْضِي فِي أَمْرٍ دُونَهُ It also means someone who, when he makes a decision, nobody can interfere. And nobody has a position to make such verdicts except him. Now, the, the point of all of that, let me summarize, is that when we call Allah a samad we are saying only Allah can take care of our needs in a way that nobody else can. That human beings, us human beings, were desperate for the help of Allah, and we acknowledge that by us, us saying Allahu Sabah. Now, why did I start with that? I started with that because it's my understanding, and it's been mentioned by a number of scholars before me in, in tafsir literature, that the last two surahs of the Quran are actually an explanation of that concept, meaning Allah being the source, the fulfillment of all of our needs, and then two of our most fundamental needs are mentioned. Human beings are vulnerable, they're in danger, and they're in danger from uh, elements from the outside, that's in Surah Al-Falaq. And they're in danger from elements that live with, inside of them or can penetrate inside of them, and that's in Surah Al-Nas. And in, from both of those, we are in need of protection. It is in fact because Allah is a samad that we turn to Him in desperation in these two surahs. So now let's briefly talk about these two surahs and what they have in common, and what they have that contrasts them from one another. So let me highlight the, that to you first. They both begin similarly. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّي قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّي But one of them begins قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ The other begins قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ But not only does, is there a difference between, you know, the, I seek, say I seek refuge from the master of dawn or the master that tears open the, the light of morning. On the other end, say I seek refuge from the master of all people. In the second surah, there are three times the description of Allah. Rabbin Nas, then Malikin Nas, then Ilahin Nas, the master of people, the god of people. But in Surah Al-Falaq, there's only one name of Allah, the master of dawn, the master that tears light open, which I'll dig into in a second. But I want you to note something. In one of them, we called on Allah three times as much as the other. You know what that tells you? The second surah is mentioning something three times more dangerous, something far prof profoundly more difficult to deal with where you are more in need of God's assistance, meaning, meaning to turn to Allah as as-samad, and to beseech Him, and to call Him, and to beg Him, three times as much as whatever has been mentioned in Surah Al-Falaq. And so we have to look at that perspective. The other interesting thing is, in, so on the one hand, Allah's names three times as many, 
in Surah Al-Nas as opposed to Surah Al-Falaq. Only one ayah qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. The other interesting thing is, the number of things we're scared of, or the number of things we're seeking protection from in Surah Al-Falaq is multiple. Min sharri ma khalaq, wa min sharri ghasiqin idha waqab, wa min sharri nafathati fil uqad, wa min sharri hasidin idha hasad. I keep saying wa and enunciating it because it's, I seek refuge from this, and this, and this, and this. Multiple times that we seek, uh, you know, seek protection. But in Surah Al-Nas, it's actually one problem that's been described, but it's really just one problem. It's not multiple problems. It's, you know, مِن شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ is one description. So on the one hand, Allah's name was one, but the problems were multiple. Like that one name of Allah, if you truly understand it, will solve all those problems. And on the other hand, there are three names of Allah to help you deal with one problem. That's the, the counterbalance of these two surahs. So now let's dig into that. And as I do, I'd like to encourage you to share, inshallah, and like, and you know, help spread the good that, inshallah, we're trying to acquire by means of this reminder. May Allah accept it from me and from all of you. Now, when Allah says, in, and this is the part I really wanted to highlight, in Surah Al-Falaq, Allah is telling us to seek refuge from the dark, from night as it becomes extremely dark. And that's a reference to how evil can happen in the night, crimes take place in the night, night is a scary time, and all of those things. <coughs> but it's also a reference to something more. In the Qur'an, light is the equivalent of revelation and of Allah. Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Fa'aminu billahi wa rasulihi wa nuri alladhi anzalna. The Prophet is called a, 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 the sun, a brilliant sun. The Qur'an is called light. Allah is the light of the skies and the earth. Allah pulls believers from darknesses into light. And the night and darknesses in the Qur'an are the equivalent of misguidance, are the equivalent of ignorance, are the equivalent of evil. So it's not just even physically, literally darkness, but we're also asking Allah from all dark things. Like, you know, shirk, the ultimate evil, in the Qur'an is described as dhulm. In the shirka la dhulmun azim. And dhulm in Arabic comes from dhulumat, from darknesses. So even shirk is actually a kind of darkness. And when you come out of shirk, you've come back to the light, ila nur Min al-dhulumat, ila nur In any case, so we're asking Allah for protection from all kinds of evil all kinds of darknesses that are the opposite of our faith. The ultimate faith is قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُلَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ And now we are asking Allah to protect that faith and not let that faith get corrupted. And so we ask for evils that we can't be إِذَا وَقَبْ when they disappear. There are evils we can't even tell they're evils. They just disappear. Just like the night just becomes completely invisible what's going on inside of it. Right? Then we ask Allah for protection from النَّفَثَاتْ فِي العقد. Those who blow into knots, which is, uh, you know, people who start believing in superstitions. They start believing in people who do magic on them or cast an evil eye on them. And they become obsessed with this stuff. Instead of being Allah being the one who fulfills all of their needs, now they're looking for someone to help undo that spell with some other spell. Or what can I recite or what can I say? And they've even reduced the Qur'an to just words to be recited to undo spells. And we've fallen into the trap of not looking at Allah as a summit. Incidentally, something I deliberately didn't share thus far that is really important for all of you guys to understand is the beginning of both of these surahs. قُلْ أَعُوذُ قُلْ أَعُوذُ Both these words are so powerful and they're so, so heavy. When you say, say, I seek refuge. When you say that, there are a couple of things. One, when you say something, you're not the only one who hears it. Others hear it too. You're not only declaring this to yourself, you're also declaring it to others. In other words, you're letting... And by the way, when you say, I seek refuge, I seek protection, I seek shelter. When you say these things, and I say these things, I'm acknowledging that I'm weak, that I'm susceptible, susceptible, that I'm not strong enough to protect myself. I've acknowledged my own humility. We are learning just by the word قُلْ that unless we humble ourselves in front of Allah and acknowledge our weakness and openly declare our, our weakness and our imperfection, that Allah's protection will not come. Otherwise, you just say, أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ You don't have to say, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ You don't have to do that. But the قُلْ there, that the Prophet ﷺ himself recited, and now it's become a sunnah for us to recite in a part of the Qur'an, is to remind us of our own weakness. Then there's the word أَعُوذُ, which, tra- which is translated, I seek refuge. Which comes from عَوذ, أَلْعَوذُ مِنَ اللَّحْمِ بِالْعَظْمِ they, they say in Arabic, when, when soft flesh clings itself to bone, that's actually called awudh. And in, in Arabic literature, anything that is soft, gentle, brittle, easily breaks, 
you know, is very delicate that wraps itself around or finds shelter in something hard and something protective, then that's actually called the act of iyad. In other words, we're describing ourselves as weak and brittle and fragile. And we're, see, we're holding on tight to Allah for protection. When you say, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ You and I are actually declaring that we're holding on to Allah for dear life. By the way, we, we've reached the halfway point. Only a few things left for me to share with you, inshallah. You know, and, and we'll be on our way. And may Allah Azza wa Jalla again accept it from all of us. In any case, so we're, we're acknowledging our weakness. And we are acknowledging that <coughs> we're holding on to Allah for dear life, for protection, just by the word A'udhu. What also means, if you're holding on to Allah, you're holding on to what He asked you to do. You can't hold on to Allah for protection and be in open violation of what He says. And if you've messed up and I've messed up, then we make istighfar. We ask Allah to forgive and we hold on again. And we ask Allah to forgive and we hold on again. In saying, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ We've already, in a sense, implicitly declared our own repentance to Allah. How can we go back and hold on to Him for protection if we're still in violation of His commandments? If we're still in rebellion against Him? Right? May Allah Azza wa Jalla help us overcome our rebellion, humble ourselves, and be of those who seek Allah's forgiveness for all mistakes we've made, the ones we know of and the ones we don't know of. Now in any case, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ Let's think about this word. Falaq means that which tears open. You know when Musa alayhi salam parted the water, فَنْفَلَقَ Quran says that the ocean tore open. Allah describes the morning tears open. Allah tears open the morning. He says, فَالِقُ الْإِسْبَاحِ He takes the seed and He tears it open and new life comes out. فَالِقُ الْحَبِّ وَالنَّوَى That's the same word Allah is using now to describe His name. رَبُّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ The master of that which, of the master of tearing open, of bringing out new life. Allah is saying no matter how depressing, how dark, how evil your circumstances, how overwhelming it is, how endless it seems, you have now called on for protection from the one who tears darkness open and brings light out of it, who takes depression away and brings happiness, who takes anger away and brings calm, who takes your hopeless situation, your financial situation, your health situation, and he tears those circumstances open where you couldn't see any opening. All you saw was dark or and darker and darker and darker. And Allah opens it up. Allah tears it open. And only Allah can. And that's why He's Rabbul Falaq. A surah that is the entire imagery of it is dark, begins with someone who tears the darkness open, who rips, it, rips through it, and only he can. It's our acknowledgement that, Ya Allah, sometimes we're in a situation, no matter how many words of hope other people try to give us, we feel like things aren't going to get any better. How can they? You're just saying these words, they're empty words. Allah says, no, I'm Rabbul Falaq. Seek protection in me and you'll find a new opening. يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا He'll find a way out for them. The last thing I want to share with you about this surah, before I share things, some things about the next surah, is that of the list of evils that have been mentioned. By the way, again, those of you that just accidentally joined, my name is Namal Ali Khan, and I love talking about the Qur'an, and I'll keep doing it, inshallah ta'ala. And may Allah accept from me and from all of you for listening. By the way, just to remind you guys also, when we sit together like this, and even if you're sitting on your phone or your laptop or whatever, and you're just listening to something about the Qur'an, you know, حَفَّتْهُمُ malaika That angels surround us. And they're making dua for us because we're doing something to serve the word of Allah, to remind ourselves and others, you know. Yet the Darasuna who on the hadith says, anywhere in any of the houses of Allah when people sit together and trying to r- r- learn the book of Allah, Allah mentions them in His company. And angels surround us and they're making dua for us. So I, we pray Allah accepts their dua and Allah Azza wa gives us tranquility, peace and protection as a result of trying to serve His book. In any case, the, 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 the thing that I wanted to mention to you that fascinates me the most about Surah Al-Falaq is women shadri hasidin idha hasad? Is at the end of all of these evils, they seem to be pretty progressive evils. Shadri ma khalaq from the evil of whatever Allah created, meaning everything Allah created has the potential of evil in it. I have potential of evil in me. You have potential of evil in you. A rock can be used to build. A rock can be used to break, right? An animal can be used to do good. An animal can be used to 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 do harm. Anything Allah made has the potential of harm in it. And we're asking Allah to protect us from the harm that can come from anything and anyone. But at the end of it, the most harmful was mentioned. And that is from the evil of the hasid. I won't translate on purpose. From the hasid, idha hasada. When he engages in hasid. Now what in the world is a hasid? They all translate often from the envious one. Or from the jealous one. So envy and jealousy are the two common translations of the word hasid. And I believe in my studies... That though, even though I used to believe that too, that Hasid is in fact uh, the jealous one or the envious one. But actually, 
as I studied the Arabic definition of the word, I realized jealousy is only one component of the word hasad. It's a much broader problem. So I'd like to explain that to you so that you understand when you're asking Allah to protect you from the one who has hasad, what actually am I asking for? What are you asking for? التركيب يعبر عن شعور حاد يحتبس في جوف الحاسد أو يحتبس في جوف الحاسد فيكره وجود النعمة عند المحسود إن كانت موجودة وسيرورته إليه إن لم تكن It's somebody who hates you so much that if you have something good in your life they want it gone they don't want you to have it whether they get it or not that's not even the point you know, jealous is someone, I wish I had his car, I wish he didn't have it, I had it. No, 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 no. I don't want it. I just want his car to burn down. I don't want his job, but I really hope he loses his job. I gain nothing from his loss or her loss, but I really want to see them suffer. This is hasad. Or something good was coming somebody's way, and somebody goes out of their way to block the good that was coming their way, and they feel accomplished that they were able to divert good that was coming somebody else's way. Not because they're jealous or they're insecure, or it could be because of those reasons, but it could just be just purely out of spite. And some people become so demented that they only find pleasure or accomplishment when they cause somebody else pain. That becomes a mission for them. And th there might be people like that in your life, and you're like, why are you like this? Like, what have I ever done to you? Why do you hate me so much that you just think, the, you, you've even told yourself you're doing the ultimate good by destroying me, by hurting me. This in your head is a good cause for you. When people become like that in your life, and you can't figure out why would they be like this? Why can't they be normal? Why can't they just live their own life? Why are they so obsessed with you? Understand that people like Ibn al-Qayyim said, there are many diseases in the Quran of the heart, but hasad, this spite, that sometimes is rooted in jealousy, sometimes it's in pride, sometimes it's just somebody's self-righteousness, whatever it may be. Whatever reason they may have to hate you so much, to deprive you so much, <coughs> that has no cure. The only thing you can do is ask Allah to protect you from it. And it's not min hasidin idha hasad, it's min sharri hasidin idha hasad. In other words, somebody can feel that towards you, somebody can have spite towards you, somebody could want to see you deprived, but when that, that deep ugliness inside of their hearts, when that makes its way into action, when their words, their speech, their demeanor, their acts, their schemes start coming out, you will need Allah's protection to break through all of their schemes. Then you will need Rabbul Falaq. Allah will tear through whatever the schemes they're planning against you. And by the way, not only do we have to ask Allah that we don't become victims of a hasid, we have to ask Allah that we don't become a hasid. Like Allah tears that hasad inside of ourselves also because at the end of all of these, this, these dangers, the, the disease of hasad, the disease of spite towards somebody, wanting harm or deprivation for somebody, these are things that maybe I'm afflicted by too. I'm day and night thinking about who, why is this person still laughing? I hate that they're still happy. I just want them to be miserable because of what they did to me or whatever else. You know. So in these last five minutes, I just want to share with you now how this is all connected to Surah An-Nas. In Surah An-Nas, like I mentioned, Allah, Allah says, Rabb nas Malik nas Ilah nas And, you know, there's lots of things that have been said about these three names, the master of people, the king of people, the god of people, the, you know, the, the, the worshipped one of the people. What is the progression here? There are lots of rationales offered. I'll, I'll share just one of them with you. Human beings, early on in their development, they need someone to take care of them, take care of all of their needs. That's a Rabb. To provide, to protect, to take care. This is rububiyah, and that's in a sense tarbiyah also, to ensure that we are nourished. This is why al-Rabb uh, al-Malik wa Sayyid wa murabbi wa al-Mun'im wa al-Qayyim. Right? Uh, Rabb means someone who takes care, who gives you gifts, who ensures that you're doing okay, who sustains and maintains you. That's Rabb. As you mature as a human being, you need some boundaries defined. Do this, don't do this. If you make this mistake, come back and fix it this way. Here are the lines you're not supposed to cross. Right? And that can only come from an authority, and that authority is your king, Malik in Nas. So now you've got your, your needs are taken care of, and a boundary has been provided. Both of those things are in place. But human beings aren't like animals. A animals, if they're provided for, and they have a boundary, like a fence, good enough. They can live the rest of their life. But human beings have higher goals. We want to accomplish things in life. So Allah gave us the highest of all goals. And that is Ilah in Nas, the, uh, the one that we worship. The one that becomes our goal, our ideal. 
the one that we aspire to please, the one that inspires us to do good and do incredible things in the world, is our ilah. It's our highest ideal goal. And so Allah gave us this progressive, in a sense, spiritual evolution in Rabbin Nas, Malikin Nas, and Ilahin Nas. But what happens when you're not spiritually evolved? When your goal isn't Allah, when your goal is less than that, then you become a petty human being. Then your goals become less. And that's when people around you are able to influence you with their thoughts and their words and keep you busy with, you know what this one said? You know what that one said? You know what they were saying? You know what this one was doing? You know, And you're just so occupied with people and their stuff, their petty stuff, that you don't have time to step back and think, Allah made you for something so much more important. Allah made you someone who's worshipper of ilahun nas. And here you are busy with these petty things. And this is why you're asking Allah's refuge as the master of people from the one who comes and whispers to you, suggests to you and disappears, then suggests and disappears. And you would think that's the devil. It's shaitan. He comes and he disappears and that's true. But the surah began with Rabbin Nas and ended with Min al-Jinnati wa Nas. Overemphasizing that there are people in your life, not devils that are invisible only, but people in your life that are going to make poor suggestions to you, that are going to keep you down, that are going to make you become petty, that are going to make you lose purpose in life. And they will come and whisper things and influence you and preoccupy your mind. And that's just going to take over your head and you're not going to be able to think about anything else. That's the effect that people have on you. The people that you surround yourself with, the messages that you surround yourself with. Think about the messages you receive via social media. This is a message, but there's tons of other messages you and I receive on a daily basis. And those messages come and they disappear. And they come and they disappear. That's also khannas. That's also something that comes and disappears. And when these messages come and hit us, they stay inside us. They, they hover inside of us. We have to become careful about what kinds of messages we are going to allow to let inside of ourselves to influence our thought. Because we, we don't, it's not just when someone's trying to convince you something. When you expose yourself to certain kinds of behavior, certain kinds of acts, these are waswasa, these are indirect kinds of suggestion. Just being around certain kind of people want, makes you want to be like them. They're using foul language, you're around them, you start using foul language. They're doing shameless things, they didn't even ask you to do them, but because you're around them, that waswasa affected you, you start doing shameless things. This is the effect of an environment. And so when we ask Allah to protect what is inside our chest, قُلْ أَعْلُوا بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَّهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُوا فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ The one who whispers into the chests of people, it's not just shaitan coming and whispering, it's actually people too. And that's far more dangerous than any, any danger on the outside. Can you imagine? This surah, we ask Allah for way more, more, more protection. We beseech Allah three times more with His names because that's something serious. That's something you have to really look for in your life. And when you stand at night and you say, Allah, I want Allah to protect me. You're reciting these surahs. And you're not thinking about the influences that you're allowing in your life. How can you stand in the rain and there's shade right there and you say, Ya Allah, I, wanna, I want shade. Uh, dude, Allah gave you shade. Walk in. You can't just say this and not seek it. You have to declare it. And you have to come inside it. So th this was a, a brief 30 minute reminder that I wanted to share with all of you guys. Once again, I'm really excited to have taken part in this tour. Today was an incredible day in Istanbul. Alhamdulillah, met lots of wonderful people, earned lots and lots of different du'as and you know, gained, gained a lot of insights. My next stop is going to be in the UK. And I'm hoping to meet many of you, inshallah. I'm making uh, many stops in my tour. You can go to events.bayina.com slash story night. Uh, to check out you know, my tour and my schedule, inshallah ta'ala. So I'd hope to see you there, bi'ithnillah. And once again, I pray, uh, as, as I'm traveling, I'm praying for all of you and your families, and I'd ask for you also to pray for myself and my family. Take care, you guys. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.